Well, I'll, I'll express my appreciation to, to you too for having me and Debbie. And we, we always enjoy coming here. You know that. Your family to us. Uh, and you always will be. And so we appreciate that. And Richard and Pam, they, they're so, so gracious to put up with us. And, well, I do have to admit, I'm gracious to put up with Richard, too. So, <laughs> no. <laughs> we, we love one another. I'm glad to be with Scott. He's a good friend and a dear brother from years past. And uh, whatever time the Lord has to, to let us continue, I hope that that fellowship will do nothing but grow and, and get closer. So, but anyway, well, let's get to the scriptures here. I, I had Richard read the whole passage of uh, Romans 6, but my text is basically verses 17 and 18. I dealt with these last night a little bit, but I'm continuing on this issue of sanctification. Today, the message is sanctification experienced. We talked about the meaning of the word sanctify. It means to set apart. God setting his people apart for a special purpose, a special use. And that purpose and use is to glorify him as we, as we look to and rest in and follow the Lord Jesus Christ in the glory of his person, the power of his finished work, in love of his word and his people, fellowship with his people, all of those things that set God's people apart from the world. And we talked about uh, how uh, the issues of setting us apart began before the foundation of the world. And that's an amazing thing. I mean, that's awesome that God, in, in electing grace, God loved us. That, that he set us apart in his sovereign love. And, and just like Scott said last night, there's no conditions to that. It's, it's unconditional towards us. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. Sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So there's never been a time, if you're, if you're a child of God, according to the scriptures, and, and based upon the, the truth of the Bible, uh, of what a, tr what a true child of God is. Uh, you have been loved with an everlasting love. There's never been a time that God didn't love you. And so we talk about God's love. It's not a universal love. There are, there are those whom God hates. And understand, I, I think a lot of times people don't understand that because they think of God's hatred like they think of ours. Our hate, hate is sinful because it's selfish. Uh, God's hatred is justice. That, that's his just wrath against those who stand before him having their sins imputed to them, charged to them. And that's we don't want that. Uh, that's why David said, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Oh, how blessed we are. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? And so God loved us with an, has loved us with an everlasting love, even when we didn't know and love him. One of my favorite passages of Scripture is the book of Hosea. Remember Hosea and Gomer, his, the, the wife of whoredoms that he married and loved her in spite of her behavior, in spite of all that? But God loved us before we did any good or evil. He chose us. That's, that's, we're separated in his love. We're separated in his electing grace. And that's what it is. It's the election of grace. God chose us. And then when he brought us into, and, and I, I mentioned this, uh, I think Mike talked about that, that our name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Your actual name in the mind of God. That's what that is. It's not a book. I heard a preacher on TV say one time when he was talking about the Lamb's Book, he said, he said, we can surmise, a, a false preacher, and he said, he said we can surmise that, that uh, when you're born, God writes that na your name in the book, and the first time you sin, he erases your name out, and then if you ever accept Jesus as your personal Savior, he writes your name back in. Wow. I thought, you don't find this between these covers. And I thought, that, well, that's uh, his first problem, was, uh, his first uh, error, he said, we can surmise. So 
But that's not it. God, your name's been written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world. So you were separated. You were sanctified by the Father. And then he sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins, sanctified by the Son in redeeming grace. When he died, and I read that last night out of Romans 6, the first part there, when he died, I died. What do you mean? He's my surety. My sins laid to his charge. My debt put to his account. We sang that hymn there, and we owed a debt. Well, Christ took our debt. He told the Father, he said, put it on my account. That's covenant language. Put it on my account, I'll, pay, I'll repay it. And our debt was laid to his charge, and he agreed to do everything necessary to fully pay that debt and put away our sins. And that took the death of the Son of God incarnate. The Word made flesh, dwelling among us, saving his people from their sins by his death on the cross. And in that death, he brought forth an everlasting righteousness of infinite value that has been laid to our charge. And so we stand before God, washed in the blood of Christ, clothed in his righteousness, and that can never change. <laughs> that righteousness that can never be defiled, it can never be taken away because it has the, the honor, the glory, the promise, the faithfulness of God behind it in Christ sanctified by the Son. Now, we're going to talk about sanctification as to our experience of it. As we're born into this world, fallen in Adam, spiritually dead in trespasses and sins, unbelievers in darkness, deception, totally depraved. That's what we are by nature. No different from the elect as to our, our experience in life, being born, by nature, we're no different than the non-elect. That's what Ephesians 2 talks about, how we are by nature children of wrath. That's it, that, what that's that saying? If those whom God marked out for destruction, we who are chosen by God's grace, we're no different than them by nature. And yet we're born into this world even at that time, God has his hand of protection and providence over us. Even though we, we're like Hosea's Gomer. <laughs> we're going out and having, doing our thing, religiously or morally or whatever. whatever and we don't know God, and, and we're idolaters. We're, we're unbelievers. We've sold our, ourselves out to sin and self, and yet God loves us unconditionally and has his hand of protection and providence over us. He keeps us, and we don't even know him. But at some point in time, marked out by God, he's going to apply his sanctifying grace to us in our lives. And that's what I want to start to deal with now. Verse 17, listen to this, Romans 6, 17. He says, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, or you could say it this way, that as you were the servants of sin. Now, what is a servant of sin? That's an unbeliever. That's what he's talking about. You were a slave to sin. You were in the darkness. You were in the clutches of it. You, know, you didn't know God. You didn't know Christ. Didn't even know yourself. And that's what a servant of sin is, as you were but you have obeyed from the heart. Now, you know what he's talking about there. He's talking about the new birth, the new heart given by God. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. Now, that word form is like an identifying stamp. It's like a tool and die. The die is cast, and that's what that word form is. It's like you've been stamped. All right? By what? Well, you, uh, you gave your heart to Jesus. No. <laughs> you turned over a new leaf and you quit smoking and drinking and cussing. No. Instead, if you're doing those things, you need to quit them. But that's not the stamp. That's not the identification mark. 
What is it? That form of doctrine. Teaching. That's what that is. Right doctrine. And it says, which was delivered you. Now, you look at that and you think, well, that's talking about the doctrine preached unto you. And you ought, listen, that doctrine is preached in the gospel. That's the doctrine of Christ. It is preached to us. It pleased the Lord by the foolishness of preaching to save them that come unto the Father by him that believe. And so faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Literally what that's saying is that form of doctrine, that form of teaching, which you were delivered to. And here we have the first act of sanctification in the, in the grace of God and salvation as to our experience of it. The first thing God does by his sovereign power and will and grace is he takes his people whom he loved with an everlasting love, whom he chose before the foundation of the world, whom he sent Christ to die for and be buried and raised again the third day. He takes them out from under the preaching of the lies of the world and brings them under the preaching of the gospel. That's the first separation. Now, at what point in time he brings that sinner, that elect sinner, whom he loved, for whom Christ died, to a saving knowledge of Christ, we don't know, until he brings us to faith in Christ and repentance. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But that's an act of providence. My friend, every one of Christ's sheep are going to hear his voice in the preaching of the gospel. And what is the gospel? Romans 1, 16 and 7. Paul in Romans 1, he starts off talking about how the gospel is the, is the preaching of the glorious person of Christ, made of the seed of David according to the flesh, declared to be the son of God by power and the resurrection from the dead. He's God manifest in the flesh. Who is Jesus Christ? He's the Savior. He's the, he, he is the Messiah. He's the Lord of glory. He's the only one who is qualified and chosen and willing to save his people from their sins. And that's what it takes to save us. It takes one who's appointed by God. It takes one who is able to do what is required and one who is willing to do what is required. Who fits that bill? Only the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. And what did he have to do in order to save his people from their sins? He had to become a man. He had to take into union with his deity, a perfect, sinless humanity, body and soul. He had to obey the law. That's why he was made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. He had to obey unto death, even the death of the cross, and satisfy the justice of God. Christ is our gospel. And what did he accomplish? He didn't make us savable. He didn't bring forth a possibility of salvation that could only be realized with our cooperation or our decision. He saved his people from their sins. He guaranteed it. Our surety, our substitute, our redeemer. He bought us lock, stock, and barrel, and he's going to have us. He said, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. This is the will of him that sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but raise him up again at the last day. You know, it says over here in verse 7 of Romans 6, it says, for he that is dead is freed from sin. That word freed there is justified. We're justified by the grace of God through the blood and the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our standing before God. I always make a distinction in the realm of salvation so that we can understand it more fully. There are things that have to be put in this category. There are things that God does for us. 
and that has to do with the ground of salvation. That has to do with the putting away of our sins by the blood of Christ. That was done for me. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have anything to do with that as far as my works, my will, or anything. Christ alone, by his one offering, hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. You weren't there when God chose you. You weren't there when God loved you before the foundation of the world. You weren't even born yet. You were only in the mind of God Almighty, certain to be born, certain to be saved. But that was done for us. You weren't there at the cross when Christ died. He did it for us. That's the ground of salvation. But when we talk about our experience of sanctification, being set apart, we're talking about what God does in us or within us, and that's the fruit the result of what he has done for us. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 10, it says it like this, and very simply, verse 10 of Romans 8, and if Christ be in you, that is, if Christ dwells within us by his spirit and by his word, and that's how he dwells within his people. It's by the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and by the word of God that's been written on our hearts. So if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. This physical body is still going to die. That's a consequence of sin. Sin cannot condemn us. Sin cannot charge us in the sense of putting us in a wrong standing with God. But boy, it can sure do a number on us. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> I didn't always have gray hair and wrinkles and not bad back, and arthritis. The body is dead because of sin. Paul wrote, who shall deliver me from this body of death? But he says, thank God, look at it. But the spirit is life, spiritual life within us because of righteousness. Well, where do we find righteousness? Only in Christ. His righteousness imputed. And out of that righteousness comes life. It's the resurrection life of Christ. And in order to apply that to us, setting us apart from the world, the first act in our experience is God bringing us under the gospel wherein eternal life is revealed through Christ. Romans 1.16 uh, says, For the gospel is the... I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ... For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and the Greek also. And you understand when the New Testament says the Greek, it's talking about the Gentiles. And he says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. What is that righteousness of God? It's the merit, the quality, the power of the obedience unto death of Christ as my surety, my substitute, my redeemer, my life giver, my preserver. And it says, from faith to faith. What do you think that means? From faith to faith. I'll tell you what I believe it means. It means from knowledge revealed, the, the faith, to knowledge received, the gift of faith, whereby we receive it and believe it and latch on to it. For it's written, the just, the justified shall live by faith. So the first act of God for us to experience being set apart in this life, he brings us under the gospel. God is not going to give you a new heart. He's not going to regenerate or convert you. He's not going to save you under the preaching of a lie. Mark it down. So many people, they think, they think salvation has something to do with starting out as a, a free willer or an Arminian and morphing into a Calvinist. That's not the way it is. There's plenty of people who become what they call Calvinists and remain lost. They never come to repentance. I, didn't, I learned the gospel before I learned what, the, what uh, Calvin preached. And let me tell you something. The Apostle Paul was long before Calvin. So it has nothing to do with John Calvin if you're into that. 
Now, we, we talk about the five points of Calvinism, which are gospel points, and we know that. But they were, that, this is biblical stuff. This is not Calvinistic. This is not just another denomination. This is not just another uh, uh, level of Christianity. No, this is, this is life and death. Life and death. Look at it again, verse 17 of Romans 6. God be thanked you were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart. The heart. Now, what does the Bible say about our natural heart? I think it's in Jeremiah 17, isn't it? The heart is wicked, desperately wicked, deceitful, above all things. Who can know it? What does it say about the natural man? The natural woman. What is a natural man? That's how we are born naturally into this world. And it says in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. He can, neither, neither can he know them. They're spiritually discerned. He has no spiritual life, no spiritual mind or knowledge, no spiritual desire. That has to be given by the Holy Spirit in the new birth. Look at verse 18 of Romans 6. Being then made free. Now the word, over in verse 7, the word freed was justified. Here the word free is liberated. Being then made liberated from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Now think about it. How are we liberated from sin? Does that mean when God saves us or when we're born again, we stop sinning? Well, if it does, we all might as well pack up and go home right now because it's just not true. None of us can say that we don't sin. We're sinners saved by grace. And I know there's guys out there who argue about that we shouldn't call ourselves sinners and all that rot. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story. To God be the glory. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Well, this is the second experience of separation. We're born again by the Spirit. You must be born again, Christ said, or you cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. We have to be given a new heart. Look over at John chapter 1. The Gospel of John chapter 1. And in verse 11, speaking of Christ, of John 1, 11, it says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Some commentators say that's referring to the Jewish nation. He came unto his own nation, own people, and he was in his humanity a Jew, and they received him not. But you know what? Even us, as the elect of God, we don't receive him naturally. There has to be a change made. And what is that change? Look at verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power. And that word power is not ability, it's the right or the privilege. In other words, do you claim to be a child of God? And we could ask you, what right do you have to make that claim? All right. Well, as many as received him, to them gave he the power, the right to become or to be called the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. Now look at verse 13. Those who, who, those who receive him, those who believe on his name, which were born. They were born. Well, I was born September 7th, 1953. Is that what it's talking about? No. Which were born not of blood. In other words, this has nothing to do with my natural birth or anything to do with my human heritage or ancestry. And I think the main point that he's making here is just because you're a Jew doesn't make you a child of God. But that applies to all of us, not of blood. If your parents were true believers, that doesn't make you a true believer. Nor of the will of the flesh. Now, I believe what that's talking about is the works of the flesh. You're not born by the works of the flesh. You cannot work your way into spiritual life. 
You cannot work your way into the kingdom of God. Salvation is not by works. It's by grace. And then he says, nor of the will of the flesh. It's not by your will, what do you call it, free will, whatever will, your decision, this idea of decisional regeneration. You make a decision and then you're born again. That's what uh, that book by Billy Graham, that's what they say, how to be born again. You make your decision for Christ, and then he gives you, no, no. You've got to be born again by the Spirit. You've got to be given a new heart. What is the heart? It's the mind. It's the affections. It's the will. It's the conscience. It's the inner man, the inner woman, the inner desire. So it's not of the... Blood, not of blood, nor, nor the works of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but you're born of God. Begotten again from above by God. James 1.18 says, with the word of truth, the word of life. The Holy Spirit is the sovereign agent of, of, in giving the new birth, applying the life. And the word of God, the gospel, is the means. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And what happens? Go back to Romans 6. Being then made liberated from sin. How liberated from sin? Now we see by God's grace through the gospel in Christ that our sins cannot condemn us. See, in this, in this matter of faith, God-given faith that causes us to look to Christ, and rest in Him. Now that separates us from the world. That's sanctification of the Spirit. But one of the first things that happens here is there's a reckoning. Now look over here at verse 7 again. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Dead how? Dead in Christ. Christ died and we're set free. Justified by His grace. Declared righteous in Him. So verse 8 says, Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. What does that mean? That means if Christ died for me, then I'm going to live spiritually, eternally. Verse 9, Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, we serve a risen Savior. He lives, He lives. Death hath no more dominion over us. Now, this body's going to die, but that's not the end, folks. We're going to be changed in the twinkling of... We're going to live spiritually. We're going to live eternally in Christ. And look at verse 10. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. He is one death. By one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now, here's the reckoning. Look at verse 11. Likewise, or in the same way, or in the same way that Christ died unto sin. How did Christ die unto sin? He didn't die unto sin's corruption or contamination. He died unto sin's condemnation. He was never corrupted or contaminated with our sin. He died under the judgment of God to put away our sin. Likewise, in the same way, reckoned. That's the word impute. Account. You also yourselves to be dead unto sin. What does that mean? Sin cannot condemn us. While we're in this life, it can plague us. It can contaminate us. It can, it can bother us. And that's one of the things that separates us from the world because we're in a spiritual warfare but he says, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust there. Fight it. That's what he's saying. Sin cannot condemn me. Sin cannot be laid to my charge. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? What a separation that is. He brings us to faith in Christ and repentance of dead works. That separates us from the world. Who do we look to for salvation? We look to Christ alone. Who does the world look to for salvation? They look to themselves. They really do. Now, 
if you would ask a religionist, for example, in, in some church that calls itself Christian, are you looking to Christ alone? They may say yes. But who is the Christ they're looking to? And what did he do? What did he accomplish on the cross? See, the Christ you're looking to, if you're a believer, the Christ I'm looking to is different. And it separates me from them. Because I know who he is and what he accomplished. They, most of them, think, well, he died for everybody. Now it's up to you. You make the decision. You make it effectual by what you do. But if you know Christ, you're separated from them. They look to themselves to keep it going. I saw a video the other day on on the, the internet, this preacher was talking about how once saved, always saved is a demonic doctrine. Well, I'm separated from that guy. You see what I'm saying? Now, I know there are others who believe once saved, always saved, but their once saved, always saved is not conditioned on Christ alone. It's conditioned on themselves. Well, I'm separated from them too, aren't you? Is that the Christ you're looking to? Somebody says, well, you know, we're different denominations. We just, we just uh, believe, but we believe in the same God. No, we don't. No, we don't. The God who loves everybody and is trying to save everybody is not the God that we worship. Isn't that right? We're separated from that. You see, this is our experience of sanctification. God has brought us to repentance. And what do we repent over? Somebody says, well, I repent of my bad behavior. Well, that's fine. But that's not the essence of gospel repentance. Look at Philippians chapter 3 with me. Here's the essence of gospel repentance that separates us from legal repentance, which is not godly at all. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, he says, we are the circumcision. What's he talking about? He's talking about spiritual circumcision, which is regeneration and conversion, the new birth, the giving of a new heart, which worship God in the spirit. Now, some translations capitalize the word spirit. Some don't. If it's capitalized, obviously, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. And what that means is we worship God as the Spirit leads us to worship God and inspires us to worship God. And how does the Spirit lead us and inspire us to worship God? According to truth in the Scripture. The God we worship, Scott had a lot to say about the God we worship last night, didn't he? How many people around here who claim to be Christian worship that God? Huh? Not many, are there? And it's sad. But the God he preached is the God I worship. It's the God you worship. And that separates you from the God that is generally being preached out there. So we worship God in the Spirit. Now, if the Spirit is not capitalized there, then what he's talking about, we worship God sincerely from the heart, again, according to the Word. And both are true. So look at it. He says, we worship God in the Spirit and we rejoice in Christ Jesus. That word rejoice is translated glory. God forbid that I should glory. I read last night 1 Corinthians 1, verse 31. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 31. Let he that glory, let him glory. In, the, in other words, we boast or we have confidence in Christ Jesus. We don't have confidence in ourselves. We have confidence in Christ who met all the conditions and qualifications and stipulations of my salvation. It's in his hands. Thank God it's not in my hands. It's in his. And then we have no confidence in the flesh. And then Paul goes down through a list of things that he used to boast in when he was lost. 
as a religionist. But then he says, look down at verse 7. He says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. The very things that modern religionists have confidence in as to their salvation, conditioned on themselves, measuring themselves by a sliding scale of what they call righteousness and holiness, those are the things that God has set us apart from in repentance. We repent of what they boast in. Isn't that right? And Paul says, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. You can't get any more separated than that. Those who boast in their decision for Christ. You know what we call that? Dung. That's a heck of a separation, isn't it? That's sanctification by the Spirit. That's what God gives us. That's what God brings to us. We're not going to do that on our own, of our own free will. He said, I want to be, I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faithfulness of Christ. Well, one more thing. Go back to Romans 6, and I'll, I'll conclude with this. Separated as to our experience, providentially, bringing us under the gospel, giving us a new heart and the new birth, bringing us to faith in Christ and repentance of dead works, and then bearing fruit unto God. Look at, look at verse 20 of Romans 6. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from or to righteousness. You didn't know what righteousness was. You weren't submitted to the righteousness of Christ. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? The fruit of that is something you're now ashamed of. Somebody say, well, I'm ashamed that I, I was a rounder, a thief, or a smoker, or whatever. Okay, I'm ashamed of my former religion. Where I was trying to, to promote what I thought was godly, but it was actually evil. He says, for the end of those things are death. Now jump over to Romans 7 and verse 4. Listen to this. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law, the law cannot condemn us. How do we get that way? By the body of Christ, the death of Christ, that we should be married to another, united to Christ, even to him who's raised from the dead, that we should what? Bring forth fruit unto God. And what is that fruit? That's the fruit of faith and repentance and praise and worship and even obedience. And it's separated. Our, our works and our obedience do not save us or do not sanctify us, but our works, our praise, our obedience is sanctified because it's set apart as fruit unto God and not fruit unto death. And I'm going to get into a little bit more of that tomorrow when I talk about what actually separates us from the world. But right here, this is the experience of sanctification. God set us apart for himself, for his glory, in Christ and praise his name that we believe in him and have no confidence in the flesh. Okay. Okay, we'll take about a 10 minute break and then we'll gather back in here about about 11:05.